Hey cats, today we're going to talk about John Coltrane's tune Giant Steps. This is a pretty popular tune. I know Vox has already done a whole video on it. What most people recognize about it was his contribution to the more exploratory, experimental side of jazz music that would eventually become modal jazz and then later into like free jazz. What caught my attention about it though was that Giant Steps employs a little something called an interval cycle. Full disclosure, there's like a million different ways to analyze the changes of giant steps, but for the purpose of this analysis, we're going to look at it in the context of interval cycles. Okay, so, what actually is an interval cycle? It's a great question. In short, it's when a composer starts a piece of music on one chord and moves to another chord by a specified interval or combination of intervals. So, for example, a perfect fourth and then continues that process as the basis of their composition, etc. Uh, interval cycles are non-diatonic by nature because they're symmetrical, usually, meaning they resolve to the chord or note that they started on. Uh, this technique has been used a lot by uh, some cats historically, like uh, Bartok, Webern, Berg, Scriabin, and a few others that I don't remember. Now, Coltrane changes are a more contemporary example of an interval cycle. Uh, Coltrane uses a chromatic third bass cycle uh, as a form of chord substitution for the usual changes on various jazz charts, uh, like when he's soloing. Uh, we can hear this especially well in his solo on Three Little Words, a tune he recorded with Milt Jackson back in 1959. Eventually, Coltrane actually began composing with this technique, not just improvising. Later that year, he would record uh, one of those tunes, well, something he called Giant Steps. So right off the bat, we can tell that Giant Steps is divided into two eight-bar phrases. The first eight bars of the tune consist of two sequences of chords, both based on that chromatic third cycle that we talked about earlier. It starts on B major, then it moves up a third to D7, then up a fourth to G major, then up another third to B flat 7, and then up another fourth to E flat major. So this interval cycle we've created here uh, moves up a third and then up a fourth. In the fourth bar of the tune, we sort of deviate from that. We move uh, over a tritone and essentially reset on a 2-5 into G major. And then the cycle starts again from there. 3, 4, 3, 4. Tritone again to 2-5. This section definitely has a lot of that chromatic third motion going on, uh, mostly between the individual chords. Uh, but the cycle itself isn't as strongly implied here as it is in the uh, second section. The next eight bars are kind of similar in that they continue on the last part of each of those previous cycles, the 2-5-1 part. It starts on E-flat major, and then it 2 fives again to G major, then another 2-5 to B major, and then again to E-flat major. So the sequence we have here is 6-4-4, four, four, repeating. Uh, that's definitely a more consistent interval cycle than the previous section, but where's the chromatic third relationship? It's not necessarily between each chord, but it's actually between each key center. Just bear with me for a second on this. In this section, the third sequence moves every two bars. So if you ignore the two fives, you have E flat, G, B, and E flat again. Add the two fives back in, and you're not moving in chords anymore, you're moving in key centers which is pretty nutty, if you ask me. To get a better understanding of how Coltrane changes actually work, we're gonna need to visit an old friend. All right, hope y'all remember this guy because it's gonna be pretty important for this. So what Coltrane actually does is he takes a triangle, drops it on top of the circle of fifths, connecting the three notes that are a third away from each other. So for example, B flat, D, and F sharp. In Giant Steps, Coltrane goes through three key centers in total. Each is introduced really early in the tune. It starts in B major, then E flat major, and then G major. He moves through these key centers through a combination of interval cycles and traditional jazz harmony, specifically the 2-5-1, which we talked about earlier. 
After spending a few bars in a key center, he moves to the dominant, or the 5-7, of the next one in the cycle, then on to the new tonic. Coltrane studied the circle of fifths pretty religiously, even coming up with his own sort of third-based version of it, seen here in a drawing he gave to Yusuf Latif in 1961. I'll leave that up for a bit. Now, if you're involved with jazz music in really any capacity, there's a good chance you're at least passively aware of the uh, cultural significance of Giant Steps. I think that aforementioned Vox video sums it up pretty well. These chords came to be known as the Coltrane Changes, and improvising over them is considered a rite of passage for jazz musicians. Soloing over Coltrane Changes is daunting, to say the least. That same video explains why the piano solo on the original recording sounds so halted. Uh, pianist Tommy Flanagan understandably had a lot of trouble with all the fast-paced and uh, seemingly unpredictable modulations in the changes. In fact, Flanagan's solo has actually kind of become a meme in the jazz world. I feel kind of bad for the guy. So how can you solo on Coltrane changes? Because of the traditional 2-5-1 pattern that jazz improvisation usually relies on doesn't really hold up as well. Uh, which makes it hard to tie ideas together coherently. Remember earlier when I said there's a number of different ways to analyze giant steps? Well, there's a number of different ways to analyze giant steps. So, let's look into a few of them, starting with what Coltrane himself did on his solo. In an article on jazzwise.com, uh, Coltrane's biographer, Lewis Porter, discusses how Train uses uh, patterns in his solos quite a bit. Uh, he's quoted as saying, an alternate recording sees Coltrane's conscientious application of patterns, most notably a 1-2-3-5 grouping, equivalent to do-re-mi-so. So, that kind of effect, which in both root and inverted forms appears numerous times throughout his solo. Indeed, on the master take, Coltrane would use this pattern root form some 35 times. So looking into it, a good amount of Coltrane's playing and writing is actually very heavily pattern-based. Check out what happens when we just play guide tones on giant steps really slowly. So yeah, obviously that's a lot going on there, but if you look into that, there's a lot of a lot of those harmonies seem like they could be in another tune over simpler changes. Um, like especially a lot of those in the in the uh, second half of the tune, you've got that That's all. That's all moving down by either half steps or whole steps, which you wouldn't have initially expected, or at least I didn't initially expect because the changes seem so all over the place. But it's these little patterns that Coltrane picked up on. Like, you know, he would find two, five, one licks that worked. Take a little listen to a part of Coltrane's solo in the original recording. Crazy. Go back a little bit. But like isolating these lines that Coltrane plays, like playing them slow, just with the changes. It really highlights his mastery of this, like, this particular chord progression. And I don't know. I just think that's awesome. I don't really have a point here. I'm not going anywhere with this. I just think John Coltrane's a genius. That's that's it. That's that's the essay. To revisit Lewis Porter, he says that a uh, giant steps is essentially an etude that is meant to focus on third related chord movement, which was really uncommon in jazz music prior to uh, the album's release. John Coltrane was really one of those once in a generation kinds of talent. From his improvisational prowess to his uh, pattern based compositional ideas and approaches, I'd say he's been largely influential for what contemporary jazz music is today. Anyway, thanks for sticking around, it's been fun.